the Spiritual Brew Pub Podcast will help you navigate spiritually after or during a belief shift, deconstruction, or crisis of faith. Not to try to convert you to a particular destination, but give you the resources you need to evaluate your future belief or unbelief and help you follow the religious historical evidence wherever it leads. I'm your host, Michael Camp a recovering conservative evangelical, the operative word being recovering, sharing my journey and helping others rebuild faith or a reasoned philosophy of life. So grab your brew of choice and learn how fact-based history helps us both critique and rethink faith. Why do we call it a brew pub? Because we like to hang out in them, at least metaphorically. A pub is a great place to let your hair down. Share your true thoughts about your journey and discuss things with an open mind in a non judgmental environment. Welcome, everyone, to the Spiritual Brew Pub. I'm your host, Michael Camp. We are the safe haven for ex evangelicals, church burnouts, spiritual refugees, and especially those who want to explore spirituality and follow the love ethic of Jesus but outside evangelicalism or organized religion. Today, we are very fortunate to have a real scholar and theologian with us, Thomas J. Ward. Tom is an author, theologian, philosopher, and scholar of uh, multidisciplinary studies. Uh, He's an award-winning author and editor of more than 30 books and an award-winning professor uh, he directs the North Wind Theological Seminary Doctoral Program in Open and Relational Theology. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Mm, thanks. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, I am too. I'm very honored to have you uh, on, on today for several reasons. Uh, one, I'm sure we'll have an amazing and intellectually stimulating conversation uh, with an astute mind. And that's <laughs> you, not me. <laughs> and secondly, I was really honored that you wrote an excellent endorsement for my book and uh, breaking yeah. that faith. Congratulations so I really appreciate that, that. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about a lot, mostly probably about your newest book, uh, The Death of uh, Omnipotence and the birth of amipotence. I don't know if I said that right, but <laughs> <laughs> you you coined the term. So how do you pronounce it? <laughs> I say it amipotence. Oh, amipotence. Okay. Yeah, Good. there you go. All right. And before we get to that, we'll hear uh, some of your background and how you came to be uh, a theologian and, and an author. And, and I did hear a rumor that you have been through two heresy trials. Is that true? <laughs> Well, I'll explain the details. It's mostly oh, you true. explain the details. <laughs> yeah. I just, okay. I just want to let you know that uh, you, if you have done that, if that's true, then you are in the running for the uh, the Heretics Hall of Fame. So, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and you are in good company, though. Uh, you know, we love we love heretics here on the Spiritual Brew Pub, by the way. And you're in good company. I think uh, Jesus was probably considered a heretic. Paul and several of the church fathers. <laughs> And many uh, others today. So uh, we'll get into that. But let, let's uh, before we get into your the subject for your book and and uh, talking about um, you know things like uh, uh, whether God is all powerful or not uh, and uh, the problem of evil in the world and things like that. Um, why don't you share a little bit about your story and your religious background and how you got to where you are now? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I grew up attending the Church of the Nazarene Congregation in Othello, Washington, which is in eastern Washington. You probably know the yes, general I've, area. Yes, I've been there yeah. before. Yep. Okay, I, yeah. I live in Washington, yep. <laughs> I was a person who took my faith very seriously as a kid, and so did my family. Uh, I eventually became a kind of an evangelist with Campus Crusade for Christ. Oh, wow. Uh, gung-ho kind of a person. And then my senior year of college, I took a course in philosophy of religion and for the first time really took seriously arguments from atheists, agnostics, people in other religious traditions. And in reading that material, I had to admit that I didn't have as good a grounds as I thought I had for believing in God. 
Mm -hmm. And I remember coming to pick up my fiance, who's now my wife, her getting in the car and me looking at her and saying, I just can't believe in God anymore. Wow. And um, my reasons for rejecting belief, or at least not being confident in any belief, uh, had, were intellectual. It mm -hmm. was, you know, I could definitely see things wrong with the church and I'd been hurt, but it wasn't that sort of thing that led me to where I was. It was discussing arguments for and against God's existence. But I eventually came back to belief in God based primarily on two things. One, I had this search for meaning in life, and I didn't think my life or life in general could have ultimate meaning if there wasn't something like a ground of meaning that most people call God. And secondly, I had these deep intuitions that I ought to be a loving person and, and other people ought to love as well. Right. That in some sense, love was the answer. Yeah, right. But I, I couldn't make good sense of those intuitions if there wasn't this ultimate personal lover that most people call God. And based on those two ideas, I slowly started to build back a kind of belief structure that I'm not certain about, but I think is more plausible than right. um, having no belief well, in God at all. Yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing story. I definitely relate. So many people relate really? to that, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and at, I always say what matters most, and I come to the same conclusion, love, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, when people talk about the problem of evil, and I often say, well, what about the problem of love? I mean, why mm -hmm. is there love in the world if there's, if there's just materialistic, cosmic, you know, luck that we yes. that we're here, right? You know, so so that's that's really fascinating. There's, I think, there's things inside of us that we that kind of guide us and so forth. But the intellectual part now that's really important, and so much of the church has I ignored that. And yeah. uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we're discussing your book is because mm. you know you don't people like you don't ignore it, and there's there's uh, philosophical reasons why. The standard or traditional view of God uh, does, just uh, doesn't measure up. So right. we'll get into that. Um, so let's start with what's your definition of omnipotence, uh, and um, how did you come to doubt it? I mean, what, what what went through your mind then? Well, I've been thinking about God's power and love for a long time, probably since I was you know an early teenager. And usually, or at least early on, it was under the um, auspices of trying to work out why there's evil in the world if God is omnipotent and loving. And um, I eventually came to think that omnipotence, at least understood in three ways, doesn't make sense. Omnipotence understood as God controlling everything which you can get that kind of omnipotence in some forms of Calvinism. Right. Calvinism really stresses that. Yep. Yeah. Sovereignty. Yeah. Sovereignty of God. Yeah. That's usually sovereignty means God does everything in that yeah. tradition. I mean, right. that, I, was, I was taught that in some of the churches I went to. Yep. Yep. Second idea of omnipotence, maybe God doesn't control everything, but God can do anything. Mm-hmm. And I came to think that that was problematic, which we can go into details. And then the third one, and this was the last kind of domino from, to fall for me when it comes to thinking about omnipotence. Many people think God is omnipotent in the sense that God could control anyone or anything at any time. Not that mm -hmm. God is always controlling everything all the time, mm -hmm. but God could, could intervene periodically to right. you know, make sure something happens single-handedly. Right. Right. And I reject all three of those views of omnipotence. Okay. All right. So that's, you just came to the, came to the uh, realization that they just don't line up philosophically or maybe in the real world when you, well, things are yeah, being. you know, it's, it's philosophically, it has problems. And I yeah. begin to realize that, you know, two plus two, uh, God can't make two plus two equal 397. God right. can't make a round uh, square. God can't decide to stop existing. These kinds of philosophical right, conundrums. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then it was experiential in the sense of the problem of evil. Like, you know, if God was so loving, then a God who is omnipotent would stop, you know, 
rape yeah. or the Holocaust right. or whatever. Yeah, all the pro the evils of the world. Right. Yeah, I got but it. The last one to go was the Bible one, and mm -hmm. I think it's because I had been so conditioned to read and interpret the Bible through the lens of sovereignty, omnipotence, almightiness, whatever word you like. Right. And to think that the Bible actually proclaimed that view, or at least hinted at it. And I now no longer think the Bible explicitly justifies omnipotence, yeah. sovereignty, or almightiness. Right. We'll get we'll get into that a little in a little while, but right. That's a good that's a very good point. But there are words in the Bible that certainly appear that uh, it says that God is uh, omnipotent. Uh, I can't even say it now. Uh, omnipotent, but yeah. but we'll, we'll we'll get into that. Do they really say that? Right. right. So, but before we go on, um, also uh, let's get in a little bit. <laughs> I'm I'm curious about your heresy trials. So you had <laughs> doubts. You, I mean, were this as, was this about you know this God can't or this I mean this 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 new this new uh, notion that is is not really new. But you're yeah. saying this is really the original. Is was this all about this issue, these heresy trials? Yeah. Well, the first trial um, really didn't have explicitly to do with these issues. It kind of was more of a general thing. It was okay. a matter of uh, a college president really getting pressure to kick me out, basically. Which college uh, then, was that? Do you can you say what college that is? Yeah, Northwest Nazarene University. Okay. Uh, right. I still live a mile and a half from the place. So I'm okay. Um, All right. I haven't even moved out of the area. Right. But in this case, they were just trying to find anything to get rid of me. So I had to answer 66 questions. You <laughs> no, know, and, no. 66 <laughs> some questions. of them were very specific, others were quite general. Oh my um, gosh. Is there a 66 question heresy? Uh, uh, uh... Uh, questionnaire that's official? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but the result of that was that even though, like the people who heard my case, they couldn't, they didn't actually say I was a heretic. Uh, they worried, they had some worries about my views, including what I think about God's power, but they didn't uh, declare me a heretic. Okay. All right. The, uh, the president ended up figuring out another way to get rid of me based on reduced enrollment. Oh, I see. Yeah. All yes. uh, right. I got you. Well, yeah, yes. they got the, they got what they wanted, but, but yeah. by a different <laughs> way. Okay. Yeah. So it was, it was the power of God, uh, ideas and what else did you say? Like how you viewed the Bible or something? Or? Oh, one was my view of God's love. No, I don't think anyone's scripture. One uh, was my view of the virgin birth. Okay. The All right. There's two. some other, right. Some other things, right. They didn't yeah. quite line up. Right. Gotcha. Evolution, okay. I think was part of it. Anyway. Yeah. It yeah, was really right. not so much like here is the issue that we're getting rid of you. Yeah. It was, you know, you're just too progressive on a bunch of things. Let's yeah. You're too progressive. Something that. So know, what about the second one? So. Actually, there's three. <laughs> oh, no. Well, well heck, you but, shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the second one wasn't technically a trial, even though I sometimes called it was. It was an investigative hearing. Oh, on wow. This I one, mean, it's semantics. Had, Come on. Exactly. Right. It's semantics. <laughs> exactly right. In this one, uh, I was charged with five theological issues and one issue related to my being queer affirming. The oh, theological right. okay. issues. Oh, yeah, you wrote a book about that, too. Yeah, That's yeah. Another book. Okay. The theological issues were all bogus and those went right. away. But yeah. they were exactly right about me being queer affirming. And the denomination in which I'm an ordained elder is not queer affirming. It doesn't have a Church of the Nazarene. Issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I got you. Um, the people who heard my were at the hearing there did not recommend that I be disciplined. And so, you know, in one sense, I quote one in that uh, I wasn't disciplined, but the case remained open. And yeah. now, just about a month ago, I've been told two people have signed papers against me on the same issue, the queer issue. Okay. And I've been told this fall, I'll go to this third event. Technically, it's the second trial, but it's. Oh, that's the third one. OK, it's yeah, coming yeah. up. OK, yeah. all right. Well, definitely after that one. We'll we'll get you in the hall. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. No, I never had that experience, but I had had uh, w when I went to the mission field back in the nineteen uh, uh, nineteen ninety. 
my 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 church you know had a little talk with me about this and then you have to line up with their statement of faith and they didn't know that i was more inclusive when it came to uh i wasn't a universalist yet but later yeah. on i did become one but at the time i was much more inclusive and not uh, about this idea of this notion of who goes to hev heaven and who goes to hell <laughs> yeah yeah and they what did was, not like that and what uh, group so, was this this was an American Baptist church that was okay. doing a local ordination for me uh, mm -hmm. to send me as a missionary. And they were more conservative on the American Baptist church side. But okay. uh, yeah, they didn't like that. And they just said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll ordain, uh, ordain you, but don't, never teach that on the mission field. Never teach that to people. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So at the time I was just not strong enough to really stand on my own. I was just like, well, yeah. you know, I was keeping that silent anyways. Okay. You know, yeah, what the, yeah. you know, so anyways, another question before we get into your book was, is what is open and relational theology? Oh yeah. Thanks for asking. That's something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, open relational theology is a big tent under which sit a little bunch of people and movements and ideas. But the two thing that brings everybody together is one the idea that God is relational in the sense that God not only affects us, but we affect God. There's mutual influence. And that's an idea that many, many people believe, and they are shocked to discover that the most influential theologians in Christian history, like Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, John Calvin, Martin Luther, they did not think that we had any influence on God. So mm -hmm. the relational part says we influence God, God influences us. Oh, okay. The, Interesting. The, the open part says that God moves through time with us into an open and yet to be determined future. Mm -hmm. And God not only doesn't predestine things, yes, God doesn't even know with absolute certainty everything that will one day occur. Okay. So that's the open future part. Okay. All right. That's interesting too. Okay. Um, so let's go back to um, omnipotence. Yeah. Uh, why is believing in it harmful? Um, how does it impact? Um, and and the, a secondary question is, you know, what, what, what problems does it create? If it's harmful, what, what, is, what are the problems? Yeah. Maybe I could probably answer those together. I'll, I'll yeah, just go ahead. say, yeah, um, it's harmful because it sets people up to think that a loving God will rescue them or keep them safe. And then when they go through problems, they go through difficulties or harm, they're abused. Then they think, OK, if God is omnipotent, able to do anything. Right. And yet this is happening to me. This bad thing must be the case that either God is punishing me or God has abandoned me, or what I think is evil is really good in God's sight. And so it confuses people. It sets people up to think that either God has left them in the cold or the God's a kick your butt kind of God. Right. I could see that. I mean, especially the first one, it's like, oh, what, where, where are you? Oh, I have had all this tragedy. <laughs> I thought yes. you were protecting me. And a, a lot of times uh, a response might be, well, you know, um, um, you know, maybe you uh, didn't pray enough. Maybe you're not righteous enough, you know, spiritual enough. Maybe you need yes. to write, read your Bible more. Maybe you need to be more, more committed. You maybe try, God's trying to use this to uh, punish you and, and get you on the right track. I mean, right. Yeah. <laughs> that's teach one of the ones I've heard. Yeah. Teach you a lesson or something. But then, you know, then then there's other ones that you just can't explain away. And so yeah. I guess so I the other the other side of this is when when this happens and I, I just gave one example of it. But what, what are uh, what are the, some of the other rebuttals to these problems that come up? Like what what do people say? Say, OK, well, yeah, you just don't understand. God's a mystery. But. But, you know, then they blah, blah, blah. This is what yeah. this just explains what's happening. Yeah. The mystery card comes out really quickly an awful lot. You know? Yes. Right. This looks evil from your perspective, but in some mysterious way, it's for your good. Yes. Or you think you're innocent, but really God's punishing you for some hidden right. sin. Or, or the one I really, really hate is 
God allowed this bad thing to happen because God knew that in the future something worse would happen if this one oh, didn't. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, that's I never heard that one. That's very <laughs> clever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's not just something worse than the Holocaust. Okay, <laughs> exactly. <all right. laughs> yeah. And it's not. It's not. E I mean, the problem of evil that we're talking about here is the central question that most people have when it comes to an omnipotent God who's loving. But there are other issues as well, uh, what scholars call the hiddenness problem. You know, if God is omnipotent and loving and God knows that a revelation of God, who God is would help us, why doesn't this God make it crystal clear? Why doesn't this God make the information we need for full salvation obvious? And it's not obvious to a lot of people. It's not, you know, the, the sacred scriptures don't always line up with one another. People who have desire a profound religious experience, many of them never get it. And you think, well, yeah. if God's omnipotent. Right. Why doesn't God just, boom, right. make sure it happens? And I could cite other issues. Yeah, that's a that's a good one, too. I thought of that one recently. Um, you know, some people, I was in the charismatic movement for many years, and uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of <laughs> wacky things going on and there's a lot of um, uh, uh, powerful things going on that, that I think were from God, but, yeah. but uh, not everyone got them. And, you know, you know, you, that's a great question. Well, why doesn't this person get it? And of course the standard, a standard reply is that, well, they're not, you know, righteous enough. They're not, they're not committed enough. You, you know, seek the Lord with your whole heart. You must not be seeking him with your whole heart. You know, right. <laughs> and things. you can understand if, you know, a person is not seeking God, but uh, lots of people I know intentionally seek and open themselves up to God and never get the kind of blessing they right. think God can give. And so right. you wonder, well, okay, is God abandoning you? You know, do you have what, right. what's it called unconfessed sin? You know, all right. That sort of thing. All kinds of things could be right in play. Right. To, yeah. And, and, and these are, these are kind of thoughts that really mess with your mind. I mean, yes, you're not comforting thoughts. <laughs> yeah. I'll throw a couple more out there since I'm yeah. on a roll now. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, since you brought up the charismatic movement or Pentecostalism, what about what I call the problem of selective miracles? Mm, Some yeah. people seem to get a miracle. Other people don't. Right. What's going on there? Does God play favorites? You know, um, some people not pray enough times. Um, that's a huge problem when you start thinking about it. Or the problem... Uh, if you think it's a problem, I'll just say the issue of multiple religious traditions. Yes. You know, there's right. lots of people who've never heard the name of Jesus, who seem to be honestly seeking truth, who end up following, I don't know, the Buddhist tradition or right. Muhammad and Islam. Um, if God is omnipotent, could God give them a crystal clear revelation of Jesus? And therefore, you know, every there ought to be only one religion that's obviously true to everyone. Et cetera. Yes, that's a great point. Yeah. And uh, I, I was a missionary to Muslims. And okay. so the standard line was, well, yeah, if people seek God with all their heart, they'll find him or they'll, you know, God will send missionaries or they'll have a dream about Jesus or something right. like that. Yeah. So therefore, if they haven't had a dream about Jesus or they don't understand what the missionary is saying or whatever, then they must not be seeking God with their whole heart. Right. Something. Exactly. <laughs> or another one I'm sure you heard. Right. Um, they're being deceived by demons and the devil. Y yes. They're it's being deceived. Always, right. Yeah, right. which always creates problems because then it's if God is truly omnipotent, the devil ought not to be strong enough to create and, obstacles to this right. revelation. Right. And then why doesn't God have compassion on people who are being deceived, genuinely right. deceived? Yeah, yeah. So right. omnipotence is at the basis for tons of theological conundrums by people who do believe in God and the basis for many rejections of belief in God altogether. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. It's uh, it, it's a kind of an atheist maker, I think. In some yes, regards. yeah, I um, think so. So, um, you talked about in your book that you know the people who defend a I'm not, I'm, that's really all powerful God. Let's say <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, the all powerful God. 
um, they're always qualifying it. Well, well, yeah, but that's not, you know, you're not seeing it right. What, what are these qualifications that they, that they're doing? Yeah. When they qualify it. Some of them are logical qualifications, like uh, God can't make two plus two equal 397, like I said earlier, or make a round square, uh, or make um, a geometrical uh, falsity. Or um, then there's some that are related to God's own nature. So if it's the case that God is omnipresent, then God's not able to be absent from Las Vegas this weekend. Yeah. Or if it's the case that God exists necessarily, God can't say, you know, it's been a good run, but tomorrow I'm out. You yeah. know? Uh, there's going to be certain things that God can't do because of God's own nature. Okay. But All right. Then there's some things that uh, arise as, quote, limitations or qualifications based on God's relation to time, for instance. So if you're a traditional theist and you think God is outside of time, Mm -hmm. then you've got a limit on God's ability to interact in time. If you're someone like me who thinks God is in time, then you've got a limitation of God being outside of time. So you, you sort of have to pick your choice, your qualification right. there. Right, right. Um, the one that I think is least recognized but has the greatest impact on these issues is the, uh, the idea that God is a bodiless universal spirit or what mm -hmm. in the tradition we've said God is incorporeal, bodiless. Okay. Now, if that's the case, then God doesn't have the ability to lift 50 pounds with a bicep or chew bubble gum or uh, fly an airplane mm -hmm. or all kinds of things that you and I with bodies sometimes can do. Mm -hmm. And I think um, once you start thinking through the implications of that, then it should change the way you think about what God is up to in the world. Right. Okay. Okay. So you, you, you basically say at one point, these qualifications kill the notion of omnipotence. Yeah. I yeah. say it dies the death of a thousand it qualifications. Dies, dies. <laughs> yeah. Because but the qualifications get so long and you think of another problem and you got to qualify it that all yeah. of a sudden it's meaningless to say God is all powerful. Yeah, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't um, do this to some other, some other uh, subject. So we wouldn't, if I came to you and I said, uh, you know, I live in Idaho yeah. and right down the block from me, there's an omnipotent squirrel. And you said <laughs> to me, omnipotent squirrel, you got to be kidding me. Can this squirrel, uh, I don't know, shoot down an airplane? Nope. This squirrel can't. Can this squirrel be in more than one place at the same time? Nope. Can this squirrel make two plus two equal 397? Nope. And I start qualifying yeah, all these right, things. Right, right, right. And you think I'm ridiculous if I kept yeah. saying this squirrel's right. omnipotent. Right. But people do that with God all the time. Right. I got gotcha. you. Okay. That makes sense. Right. So um, we, we've, we talked about um, a little bit about the, what's, what others call the problem of evil in the world the existence of evil and so how does that destroy omnipotence yeah well i mean it doesn't destroy it in the sense that uh you know you can't believe god is omnipotent anymore you can still think god is omnipotent but then you'll just have an incoherent view of what god's up right to. right uh, so I just it, think that if you're going to destroy take, an, a, a, a coherent view of, of yeah, America. there you go. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So why is that? Well, because if God is omnipotent, then God could prevent any of the genuine evils that happened in the world. You know, I grew up in the Church of the Nazarene, and I'm still an ordained elder in that tradition, at least for a little bit longer. We'll see how long. <laughs> um, Your but, days are numbered, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> but in our tradition, and probably the, the American Baptist tradition you were in, we had this strong view of free will. Yes. And yes. so we would say, you know, why didn't God stop that rape? We would yeah. say, well, the rapist has free will, too. Yeah. And right. we thought that that somehow got God off the hook, but it doesn't get God off the hook because if someone has the power to prevent rape, but mm -hmm. doesn't do so, yeah. then we think that person isn't loving. Right. And so we not only have to say God's power isn't the power that causes evil, 
we have to t say that God's power can't prevent evil single-handedly. And right. that's why I think we have to get rid of omnipotence. Right. I gotcha. So let's get into um, the scriptures because, you know, I, when I read my Bible when I was an evangelical, well, since since then I've learned that there's a there's a lot of mistranslated words. <laughs> yeah, and as some people will probably learn today, there's a lot of lot other translated words that you may not have heard about that Tom's going to tell us about it, right? So, but yeah, the, well, you read the Bible, and uh, um, for evangelicals, most most of the time, in my experience, the NIV was the the Bible yeah. of choice, yep. and so you just thought this is you know, this is, uh, this is all true, right? This is the best translation in the world, blah, blah, blah. And there's all this talk about almighty God and nothing is impossible. We had a song in church. Nothing is impossible for you, blah, blah, blah. You know, God can do anything. He's sovereign, all this stuff, especially in the Calvinist, uh, traditions, but even in almost every church you're talking about, yes, this, yeah. right? Right. So, so it's all there, right? But you're saying that it's really not there. What, what what's all, what's behind that? What what's what yeah. the scriptures really say? So, if you read the New Testament and the Old Testament, uh, you'll occasionally come across this word "Almighty." Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, it's a translation of two Hebrew words. One is "Shaddai," as in El Shaddai, God all mm -hmm. God Almighty, is how it's translated. The other one is Sabaoth, and that's preceded by several words for God. But um, that will also be translated as Almighty. Okay. Biblical scholars tell us, however, that Shaddai doesn't mean mightiness or omnipotence. It means breasts or mountains. Mm -hmm. And so to say that God is El Shaddai is to say that God is the nourishing one, the, the uh, fountain of fertility. And Saba, oh, no, I got I got to I got to interrupt. Gotta you for a okay. <laughs> okay. No, wait a minute. That begs the question. That sounds like God is more female than ma male. Mm, sure <laughs> does. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've been hiding this on us. What? What's going on here? Well, what went on is that uh, when uh, Greeks were translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek in the second and third century BCE, they took that word Shaddai. And they used the Greek word uh, pentocrater, which means like all sustaining or all holding. And that's a little bit closer to a breast being sustaining, let's say, a life of a child or something. It's not almightiness or not omnipotence, right. but they chose that word. Um, also, they used the same word for the second Hebrew word, uh, 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 sabaoth which is better translated Lord of hosts or Lord of the councils, but mm -hmm. it's Pantocrator as well. in the, what's called the Septuagint, this second and third century BCE manuscript. So breasts and hosts becomes all sustaining mm, or all okay. providing. Okay. And then nine times, or I guess it's 10 times in the new Testament, the word Pantocrator shows up and, Later on, Pantocrator is interpreted as omnipotent in the 6th century by Jerome, I think it is. Anyway, so we go from breasts and hosts to all-sustaining to almighty, omnipotent, all-powerful. So when we get the creeds, I believe in God, the Father, almighty, creator of heaven and earth, that's a Latin phrase and omnipotent is used there for almighty and that derives oh. back from these mistranslations of scripture which, which creed was that you you quoted that was the apostles creed but the nicene creed starts very similarly similar in a nicene yeah. creed as well okay that's yeah. very interesting okay so it's even built into the creeds right that's so, right yes so are those the only words or I mean, um, is that the root oh. cause of this, or are there other yes, words? Yes, those are the only on? words that are translated almighty in English. But okay. you are right that there are a few phrases that sound like nothing is, you know, what is it, right. the New Testament? With humans, this is impossible. Right, nothing yeah. is impossible. Right, what about that? Right. Yeah. 
And uh, that's a stronger case for something like omnipotence. Right. The problem is that people who cite that ignore all the other biblical passages that talk about things that God can't do. That, that for instance, it's impossible for God to lie, says the writer of Hebrews. Oh, right, right, right. Or, right. you know, it's impossible. Or God, uh, God cannot be tempted, says the writer of James. Uh, right. God can't grow tired, says the psalmist. Right. My favorite one is uh, Paul's letter to Timothy. When we are faithless, God remains faithful because God cannot deny himself. Oh, right. OK. All right. So when we see everything's possible with, for God in Scripture, we have to also bring in all these impossibilities and then ask, OK, what's going on there? And I argue that the claim nothing is impossible for God is in the always in the context of salvation. It's it's always possible for God to offer us salvation. That's I think it should be. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I, that's the what I remembered him. I think it was the rich man per, uh, and hmm. uh, story or something. Okay. Yeah. How can people be saved? Well, nothing is impossible with God. You know. Yeah. I, yeah. Always, yeah, exactly. always in 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 the context of a discussion about salvation. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's right. That's excellent. So, um, uh, anything else about the scriptures? I mean, what, what, uh, that, that, yeah, that I think the, the other, I think the other big thing, and this is true for not just sort of the average person in the pew, but also for biblical scholars, there are plenty of passages in scripture that says, God did X, you know, God delivered the people from out of Egypt. God did this, that, and the other. Right. And people have come to the Bible with this omnipotence in mind. And then they've said, well, if God did this, God alone must have made it happen. So they think that God single-handedly brought people out of Egypt or God oh, like single-handedly that. stopped the storm or God sing yada, 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 yada. Yeah. Um, and the text doesn't actually say that. In fact, most of the time, there is explicit creaturely factors and actors that are also identified as contributing to whatever happened. But people have just assumed that whenever God does something, it must be unilateral, single-handed, God alone. And I say in this book, we need to go back and look at what the, what the scriptures actually say, and especially those that emphasize the synergy the cooperation, the collaboration so often present in Scripture. And in those instances in which only God is mentioned, we don't have to jump to the conclusion that God alone brought it about. Just like when we see instances in which, let's say, Peter does a miracle in Acts, we don't have to assume that only Peter brought it about. We can say God helped. We yeah, can say right, humans right. helped God in making these things happen. Right, and that's okay. going to help in a lot of circumstances in terms of interpreting scripture. Right. So you're saying that we we kind of start with a lens that of of all powerful God, and then we look at these passages and read into them that, that what's yes. not necessarily there. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Right. Yep. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I will um, go so far as to make this bold claim. Okay. There's no passage in the entire Bible that explicitly says God alone brought about some sort of result or outcome. Right. Um, what about none. creation? What about creation? Yeah, great question. Even in creation, the spirit hovers over quote the face of the deep, which has been in, in translated as chaos, the tohu wabahu mm -hmm. or Bahu, if you're like with the German pronunciation. Anyway, uh, yeah, even in Genesis 1, there's something there. In the beginning, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and the spirit hovered over the face of the deep. That deep there, that's a something, not a nothing. And mm -hmm. so... We have grounds, and obviously when you get into the rest of that chapter, God's saying to creation, bring forth, and then creation is cooperating. So right, even right. in the creation of the universe, we don't have to think God did it single-handedly. Right. Okay. Interesting. All right. Um, so let's go, let's pivot a little bit. Uh, the second 
part of the title of your birth is the birth of omnipotence. Omnipotence. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. let's let's tackle that. What is that? And uh, it has something to do with God being loving and uncontrolling. But let's let's unpack that for us. Yeah. Well, it's a new word that I made up. Okay. Ami. Uh, in omnipotence, ami stands for love. We find okay. it in words like amity or amicable, or oh, uh, the right. Spanish word amigo. Right. Uh, okay. And then potence yeah. means power, potential. Right. So the idea is that God's power is the power of love, this particularly uncontrolling love. I want to say. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I I was saying earlier, maybe before we started the conversation that um, I wrote a book, came out in 2019, called God Can't. Right, it's, right, right. Yeah. It's written for a, a broad audience. And in that book, I lay out five things that, ideas that together can solve the problem of evil. And it's been a really helpful book to tons and tons of people. But one of the downsides of writing a book called God Can't <laughs> is that a lot of people think that, well, God must, or a lot of people think that Tom must be describing a God who's, you know, on the sidelines in life, up on Mars, eating a, a, de a deist type God. Yeah, exactly. A deist yeah, type right. God. Yeah. yeah or, right. you know, maybe a, a, a Talikian God who's the ground of the universe, but not really doing anything in it. Right. Okay. Um, and I wanted to say, no, the God I believe in actually works in the world in ongoing relationships this God's power is loving and it's for all creation at all times. In fact, I even go so far as to say, I think God has maximal power, but even God's maximal power, because it's loving, never, in fact, cannot control anyone or anything. That's what omnipotence is all about. So that's uncontrolling powerful love is what you're saying yes, that's because right. because the definition of love is not to control right that's part of it yep right yep. right so um uh, the the love of god is is um more is the most powerful force i uh, want to say uh, that or yeah. attribute and yeah. uh you know so you're you're basically saying uh instead of saying oh god is whole is holy and powerful and everything um actually the most powerful thing in the concept of god is love is that correct yeah i think that's a good way to put it I, to put it technically i put it this way love comes logically first among all the attributes okay so you'll hear people, especially professional theologians like me, they'll say something like, well, I believe God is loving, but I also think God is powerful. And these two attributes are co-equal in God. Right, right. Which sounds all nice and great until you they actually cash out what that means in the real world. And then almost every time love gets becomes subordinate to, to power. And so they've got a sovereign God who happens to love. Um, and I think we ought to reverse that. I think we ought to start with love and then understand God's power in light of love. And therefore, this power is going to be per pervasive, influential, but never controlling. Right. OK. So another thing that uh, objection that people make um is that, you know, when you start talking about the love of God and and how amazing it is. Um, and then you start getting into saying things like, actually, God is much more loving and, and kind and compassionate than we can ever imagine. <laughs> and uh, but then people will say, yeah, but God is also wrath and God is judgment, judgment, uh, you know, justice and and all this stuff. So, you know, w what do you say to folks who, who, who try to balance the love of God with the wrath of God? Yeah, I think we should understand God's wrath in terms of love. So what people who usually understand God's wrath, they think that every once in a while God gets so pissed off <laughs> that God throws lightning bolts and, you know, blows things up out of anger or to teach you a lesson or whatever. 
I think wrath is just better understood as God's disappointment and anger when we hurt ourselves and others. But this anger doesn't lead God to throw lightning bolts, doesn't lead God to punish or harm us. Um, just like good parents can be angry with what their kids do without shooting their kids or, you know, right. <laughs> cutting yeah. off their arms. Right. I think God is angry when we hurt one another and hurt right. the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Um, yeah. yeah. I've always struggled with that. And, um, but one of the things that helped me uh, was, is that when the subject of anger in the, in God comes up in the scriptures, um, most especially in Jesus, but also in the prophets, you know, it says things like, you know, I will not harbor my anger forever. <laughs> yeah. I will save you. I, you know, uh, God, God is not, um, uh, there's lots of, lots of scriptures and there's a couple of them. I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's lots of scriptures that say that, right. Yes. That this is not a, an absolute kind of anger that, that could produce, uh, in my mind, could, that could produce a, a eternal conscious torment, for people who, uh, you know, don't measure up at the end at the judgment day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I'm against the view of hell uh, that most people have. I like to say, however, that there are natural negative consequences that come when we say no to God's love. Mm -hmm. It's not that God is punishing us by getting out the stick right. and hitting us over the butt. Right. But when we say no to that, which is going to promote what it, what is good, we're in essence saying we want something less than the good. And that's a natural negative consequence. So I actually think that God is calling us in this life and the next always to live a life of love and never punish is anyone at any time. But when we say no to love in any moment, they're just natural negative consequences when we do so. Yeah, I, that's I, I I like to explain it that way too. I mean, mm. the consequences is not is not like the same thing as God saying, "Okay, I'm going to uh, orchestrate these problems in your life." No, right. <laughs> you uh, if you decide to be uh, a violent person, then you're going to get violence thrown right back at you. You're going to have yeah. lots of problems. You're going to get in trouble with the law, whatever it is, right? All kinds of things, right? I'm totally with you. Yeah, and and that idea that God is the one, you know, throwing the negative consequences right. at you, that just stems right back to our earlier discussion about omnipotence, you know? People just have this default view that whatever comes their way must either be caused or allowed by an omnipotent God. Right. But once you take off omnipotence, then you can bring in these natural negative consequences. Right. I see. Okay. So um, I'm curious, what is your view of, of the evil one? Hmm. We're talking about the problem of evil. Well, the Bible talks about the evil one, Satan. Do you think that's a literal uh, truth uh, or is that something else going on? I'm agnostic on the belief in the devil and demons. Okay. If the devil and demons exist, then the devil and demons are localized beings with limited powers and abilities. And apparently there's something like spiritual beings. You know, I don't know for sure, but that's mm -hmm. the way they're usually de depicted. If they exist, then they're just part of the negative influences in the, in the universe. If they don't exist, I'm fine with that too. And then I just account for what people usually call demonic oppression as, you know, psychological or chemical imbalances or structural evils or whatever. So um, my theology works if there's a devil or not. Yeah. I, I'm very similar to you. Um, one of the things that uh, I came to the conclusion of is that um the Bible actually, I believe, uh, the word is more accurately translated, at least in the beginning, uh, as the adversary. Yeah. Uh, not, you know, like um, this ultimate evil uh, being, but the um, the notion that in life there are these adversaries that we have to face. You know, the negative thoughts, the the uh, the evil that we we encounter in the world. Right. Um, 
the harm that people bring to other people, et cetera, et cetera. And, and sometimes people get really caught up in that and they it's it seems like they're being controlled by some power but it's really there it's a psychological thing that's going on yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a lot to that right and, and right. i'm with most scholars i know who think that the scriptures reveal uh, reveal a development in the idea of the devil and, and demons yes over time right over time that the, the notion was developed until it Kind yeah, of morphed into something that it wasn't originally like the idea of hell. Yeah. You don't get yeah. any the right. view of hell in the Old Testament. No, it's yeah, the, right. The it comes pit. in right. It comes in uh, after yes. between the testaments, and then it doesn't come into the New Testament at all. It comes in outside the New Testament. Right, right, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, and I say that uh, what I said before about uh, Satan or or the devil is uh, from personal experience. I was uh, clinically depressed when I had my faith crisis, and um, some people, uh, I started to think, oh, I must be possessed, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because all this prayer and all this stuff is not working. What's going on, right? Yep. And so, you know, I went to someone, and they prayed, oh, yeah, I think you have a uh, you have a mini demon or something. I'd be able to I'll cast it out, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. some kind of a spirit of depression or something, you know. Well, you know, he does his thing and I don't get better. I, I get worse. Right. Nothing happens. Right. And then the only the thing that happened that that helped me was going through cognitive behavioral therapy mm. with, uh, you know, some therapists and reading a book that really helped me, you know, sort through the negative thinking I was going through and, and how to combat that. So. It's like yeah. I took on the adversary w w from this therapy and encouragement and psych uh, psychological and logical angle, not a spiritual angle. And that's how I overcame yeah. my depression. So that's, you know, that's yeah. when I'm being honorary. Yeah. When I'm being honorary with people who are really into demon possession and all right. that sort of stuff, right. I say, isn't it ironic how therapy, education, and medicine? can affect these demons but sometimes your prayers can't <laughs> yes yeah that's a good question yeah, yeah right yeah right well, how do you explain that right yeah yeah right Anyways. so okay so um uh so i think you're saying that um, omnipotence uh solves the problem of evil is that correct well getting rid of omnipotence is essential um, excuse me solving. getting rid of it right understanding yeah. that it's not true right yeah. solves that right yeah. Yeah. So um, so obviously it just means that uh, we'll go ahead and explain how you would how, how, how would you um, how does that work out? Yeah. So first of all, I just up and say God is strong, but simply can't control anyone or anything. I think that's the theoretical foundation you have to start from. I think God is a loving God and God suffers with us and empathizes with us in the midst of pain. That's actually part of relational theology, what we mm -hmm. talked about earlier. Yes, I think God is working to try to heal to the greatest extent possible, but God isn't omnipotent to be able to heal single-handedly. Therefore, God works with factors, actors, forces, some traditional, some non-traditional in our lives to try to heal us. Some healing won't occur until afterlife, but when we do see healing here and now, we can say God acted and there was creaturely cooperation. I also think that God takes whatever happens to us and try to squeeze some good from the bad that God didn't want in the first place. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, so that Christians who say, well, look, my life ended up better because I went through my divorce or yes, I yeah. lost my job. I say, no, no, it wasn't God orchestrating all of that, but God works with you in creation to try to squeeze something good from the stuff God didn't want in the first place. And then the final part is to say that to solve the problem of evil also means that we participate and work with God in overcoming evil with good. So this might offend some of your listeners, but I think God can't win unless we cooperate with God for love to win. 
-hmm. Some theologies will say, well, God is working and God invites us to collaborate, but mm -hmm. they kind of give the impression God's going to get the job done even if we never lift a finger. Right. In my view, because God's not omnipotent, God is working, but we have to cooperate if love is truly going to win. Okay. All right. That's good. Yeah, I like that. Um, especially like what what you're saying about um, God takes a bad situation and, you know, finds a way to make some good out of it. I mean, that's mm. a lot. I think a lot of people who go through religious trauma or depression or, you know, deconstruction, right? It's a very, you know, difficult experience. Yes. It's like a divorce or something like that. You're, you know, it's like you're divorcing your community or something, your, yep. your movement, right? And, and then no one wants to go through that again. And no one says, oh, yeah, I had you go through that because that was my will. No, I didn't want you to go through that. I didn't want you to be there in the begin with. But, you know, but now that it's happened, you know, let's let's build a new life and yeah. use that to help you, whatever it is that you're doing. A lot of times people are I, I, I love what I'm doing helping people going through deconstructing conservative Christianity and, and, yeah. and trying to help, help them rebuild something. And I couldn't do that unless I went through all those terrible experiences. It's just yeah, like, a yeah. you know, so that's, that's, that's a good way to, to put it. So just to cap on it, what if an atheist shot back at you and said, eh, I still think the problem of evil is just, I mean, this, you're, you're just, I don't know. They might say you're just, um, you know, hedging God and making him less just to solve this yeah. problem. How would you respond? <laughs> yeah, I, I get that sometimes. Someone will say, well, if God's not omnipotent, then it's just not God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. And right, I always yeah. laugh because, you know, if, if I'm right about what the scripture says about God, you don't have an omnipotent God there. So really what the atheist or sometimes is believers, really what they're doing is they're saying, I'm so committed to this particular vision of God that if you take it away from me, there can't be any other vision. Yes, and, right, yeah. In fact, yeah, so this, I, yeah. I see this happen with people who are going through deconstructive process. They have a picture of God presented to them by their church or by the culture or wherever. They end up realizing that picture sucks. They can't yeah. believe in that God anymore. Right. And then they think, well, if I can't believe in that God, I can't believe in any God. Yeah. And I want to come in and say, you know, I've got this open and relational vision of God that fits with the best of scripture. It matches your deepest moral intuitions. It makes sense logically. It fits with science. It fits with your experiences of evil. And I just lay it out there and say, this is a beautiful vision of God that you can embrace if you want to. I'm not forcing you, but let me present it. It's far better than that view that you rightly rejected from your past. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. And I would argue it's also more historical. <laughs> I think so. You know, I'm obviously you know, I, you we're picking and choosing because there's some parts of the tradition that, you know, I reject, like when Jerome you know, well, translates the word into omnipotence. But well, yeah. when I say historical, I don't mean, you know, selective his, history. I mean, going back as far as you can to the original intent, yeah. uh, the scriptures and Jesus' teachings and so forth. So, yeah. I think it aligns very well with Jesus's teachings. Yeah, right. I, I think do so think sure. there's some yeah. portions of scripture that it doesn't align with. Like, mm -hmm. I think there's some portions of scripture that paint God as unloving. I think the writers just simply got God wrong in those instances. Yeah. Uh, but I think it fits the majority of scripture and the God revealed in Jesus. Yeah, well, that, that's the point I make in my book is that well, right, you right. Know, we, we don't have to accept everything we read in the scriptures because uh, right. uh, the Jewish people, Jesus, uh, they didn't view the scriptures that way. The, the, yes. There was a debate going on. We need to enter into that debate and say, Hey, you know what? Let's look at this and be honest about what's good and what's bad and what's ugly. And <laughs> yep. So That's um, one of the many parts of your book I like. Oh, good, good. Okay. All right. Um, so anyways, one last question. We're running out of time. Um, so how does the belief in, let's say, the all-loving God, not not controlling a limited power love, how does that impact how we live and how we worship and how, you know, what is our faith about? Yeah, I mean, it impacts it in so many ways. I'll just pick up on two, all right? Um, if God is all-loving but can't control, 
we can actually trust that God. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, right, right. That's a God whom you would actually want to be your babysitter for your kids. The God who's omnipotent and allows evil. You don't want that God to be your babysitter. Right. Yeah. The God who's perfectly loving, but can't single-handedly prevent things. And you don't have to blame that God when things go wrong. Right. That's, that's a big plus. Yeah, that is good. Yeah. A second thing is, is, you know, I started earlier in this conversation. I said, one of my deepest intuitions is that I ought to live a life of love. And the God who's perfectly loving is someone I can truly imitate. I can try to be like, I will want to be like that God. And that shapes the way I live my life and set my morals and my ethics. Um, in other words, this is a way to orient ourselves and find purpose by living a life of love, imitating the perfect lover in the universe. Right. That's good. Excellent. Well, we've run out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Tom, for being uh, my pleasure. The spiritual Brew Pub. Uh, um, we've had a great a conversation, and um, I want to uh, just shout out that your your books. Uh, I, I'm, I've read the the uh, the death of omnipotence and the birth of omnipotence, and it's really good. It's excellent. It's going to, thanks. It, it really helps. I mean, you're, 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 you're saying right now some of the major points in the book, but in the book, it really gets into more detail. So where can folks find your work and this book and other books that you've written? Yeah. You know, you can find my books on online retailers and uh, a few in-person retailers, but mostly online. Uh, so but you can also Amazon or do, Amazon you have a, do you have a website? That, I do have uh, a website. Uh, I guess you could get it through there. Uh, my website is my full name, Thomas J. Ord. Uh, the middle name is J-A-Y. Last name is O-O-R-D. Okay. All right. All right. Great. Okay. Well, thanks again, uh, uh, Tom, for being with us. Uh, folks, uh, uh, check out Tom's work and his books. Um a great scholar and theologian has really thought uh, and researched this very well. Uh, not pulling things out of the air, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is really good stuff. So until next Thank time, you, yeah, we'll see you. Uh, we'll, we'll be in touch, Tom. And until next time, folks, enjoy responsibly. <laughs>